All right. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to uh, another edition of Beneath the Surface at the Marine Mammal Care Center or with the Marine Mammal Care Center, um, sponsored by Marathon, brings us uh, these fabulous lectures. Um, today, we have a wonderful speaker who's going to talk to us a little bit about sea otters today. Um, this is part one of a two-part series we're doing on sea otters. And today, we're lucky enough to have uh, Andrew Johnson with us. Uh, let me tell you all about him. Uh, for, 10, for 20 years, uh, Andy managed the Monterey Bay Aquarium's pioneering, pioneering work with California's threatened sea otter population by overseeing the rescue and care efforts for stranded animals, facilitating field and in-house research projects, promoting collaborations with the sea otter research and recovery community, and formulating and advancing policy reform in support of sea otter recovery. In his 43-year career, he has worked on the care, rehabilitation, research, and conservation for more than 30 marine mammal species. And he has served on the sea otter <clears throat> recovery implementation team, the Oiled Wildlife Care Network Advisory Board, the Program Advisory Team and Board of Directors of Sea Otter Savvy, the Board of Directors of the Sea Otter Project, the Board of the Sea Otter Foundation and Trust, and the Board of the American Association of Zookeepers San Diego chapter. Various organizations and agencies have recognized his work, including Friends of the Sea Otter, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and the Association of Zoos and Aquariums. At Defenders, his work focuses on sea otter issues throughout their range, and he addresses threats to California's coastal ecosystems and wildlife from ocean pollution, fisheries, energy development, human disturbance, and climate change. And it, Andy attended undergraduate and graduate classes in in a haphazard fashion at nine colleges and universities before obtaining a bachelor's degree from DePaul University. We're so lucky to have Andy uh, Johnson with us today uh, to share with us about an iconic animal from California. Um, Andy, take it away. Great, well, thank you everyone for attending and uh, sort of tag teaming this presentation with the Monterey Bay Aquarium. Uh, Jessica Fuji is going to speak next week uh, and sort of go into some more depth on other sea otter uh, research and conservation activities. So it's my task just to uh, talk to you a bit about, uh, as I say, the what, the where, and the why of sea otters. Uh, what are they? Where are they? And kind of why are they? And uh, so we'll dive right in. So um. I'm going to give you a little bit of an introduction to Defenders of Wildlife, just tell you a bit about uh, the organization and what I do, and then we'll jump right into sort of the Sea Otter 101, This uh, give you some foundational information about sea otters, some of which you may already know, um, but uh, try to cover in a bit more detail and happy to answer any questions. And then we'll uh, uh, hopefully set up Jessica's talk next week on, uh, on more sea otter research and conservation. So. Um, just move a few things on my screen here. There we go. Um, so Defenders of Wildlife is a national research, I'm sorry, national wildlife conservation organization. And we're really focused on, on wildlife, obviously, um, the restoration of imperiled species and their habitats. Um, the three main areas that we uh, have expertise on is sort of on the ground projects. So we're out there across the country in various settings, working on uh, field projects, uh, research and science, and there's a very strong policy and advocacy uh, branch of Defenders of Wildlife. So, so legal, legislative, um, really focused on uh, trying to influence um, uh, political decisions, uh, new laws and so forth uh, related to wildlife. Uh, we're headquartered in Washington, DC, but we have six field conservation uh, teams or programs working in 14 states across the country. And um, so here's just a general idea. You see our DC headquarters over there. We've got a Southeast team, a group in the Rockies and Great Plains, a Southwest team, a Northwest team, an Alaska team, and uh, our team in California. So, um, so how we defend wildlife, uh, really a lot of focus is on imperiled and native species. Uh, that's kind of where the sea otters come in, um, but also their habitats. So we don't want to uh, just focus on say a single animal and um, uh, not really consider the, um, the, all the issues and aspects of, of preserving ecosystems and, and habitats for the wildlife. 
Um, so that involves advocating for wildlife, uh, speaking out on behalf of wildlife in, in various forums, uh, promoting this idea of coexistence. Um, how do humans and wildlife uh, live together? Obviously, sea otters, since they live right along the shoreline uh, in in very populated areas, in some cases, uh, you know, how do we coexist with them? How do we make sure that that they have what they need? At the same time, we want to have what we need, so uh, those need to need to get along. Uh, to, uh, to survive. Um, defending conservation laws, so you've probably heard of the Endangered Species Act and um, uh, other uh, legislation that protects wildlife. Um, the um, Defenders of Wildlife is very active in Washington, uh, making sure that uh, challenges to those laws are not, uh, are not implemented, um, that we don't lose the protections for wildlife that we've uh, worked so hard to, to achieve. And then uh, innovating for wildlife conservation, um, everything from, you know, how do we make sure that uh, that farmers and, and ranchers um, can uh, do their grow their crops and uh, manage their their uh, uh, their cattle and so forth um, without uh, conflicts from from wildlife, say wolves coming in and and uh, and uh, taking their their cows. So um, trying to find ways that. Uh, these different uh, aspects of, of life on on Earth as we as we experience it can uh, can coexist. Um, obviously, the the fight against climate change um, is kind of taking, uh, hopefully, taking uh, a stronger position in uh, political uh, political action. Um, so we're at, at the relative forefront of that um, because uh, as the sea sea levels rise, the oceans warm. Uh, the, the habitats change, the animals come into, uh, come into conflict, uh, their habitats change, and that's a, a big problem. So uh, trying to encourage our political leaders and others to, uh, to combat climate change is a big part of our work, uh, as well as fighting invasive, invasive species. So we know that, say, when a, uh, a new species gets introduced um, into a, an area that it's not native uh, to, uh, it can cause all sorts of, of havoc. So um, uh, trying to find ways to uh, fight invasive species is also important. Um, so now we get to, to sea otters, and um, specifically, I'll be talking about sea otters, sea otters in California. Um, but as you know, the otters range uh, all the way around the Pacific Rim. Um, but our sea otter here in California, and uh, Hydra lutris narius, is uh, um, all descended from just a couple of a dozen animals along the Big Sur coast. Um, they were uh, hunted to near extinction during the maritime fur trade of the 18th and 19th centuries. Um, uh, pretty much all, the, almost all the sea otters uh, uh, were gone, but there were little remnant groups around the uh, around the Pacific Rim. And um, uh, but sea otters really are, uh, you know, endemic to uh, northern Japan, uh, all through Russia, the Aleutian Islands. Uh, Central Alaska, Southeast Alaska, British Columbia, and um, and the the west coast of of, of the United States, uh, down into Baja even. So um, we really saw this uh, activity of of hunting uh, these these uh, animals with their for their amazing fur um, uh, really reduced the animals from perhaps as many as as three hundred thousand animals down to just two thousand animals. Uh, so really, almost they're almost all gone, and particularly in California, with just a few dozen animals left in a remote area of, of California. Uh, it, was, it was probably pretty touch and go. Uh, it's it's uh, it's kind of a miracle they survived. Um, uh, they became listed under the Endangered Species Act in 1977. Uh, the last uh, official count, um, which is a three-year average. Uh, tallied 2,962 animals, so about 3,000 animals in California. And um, the, the next count starts either this weekend or, or next week. Um, and it's just a question whether uh, we can get that done uh, because of the COVID uh, pandemic. Uh, one year was skipped and another, another year was kind of wasn't done properly or wasn't done to the uh, extent we needed it done. So we really haven't had a good count uh, since 2019. So hopefully we'll get one this year and see how the population is doing. Um, this just gives you an idea of, uh, I didn't, didn't correct this slide properly, but you can sort of see from, from the, uh, 
early to mid 1980s until uh, now, but the, uh, I'll use my cursor if you can see it, but the, um, the population has basically grown uh, for you know, the last almost 40 years uh, that we've been doing these, these intensive counts. Um, but there have been dips. There was sort of a dip in the mid 90s uh, to the early 2000s. Um, that was largely seen as a, 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 an artifact of infectious disease. There seemed to be a lot of uh, new diseases that were getting into the sea otter system, their, their food chain, and uh, causing a lot of disease in the population, things that they hadn't been exposed to that they uh, were particularly susceptible to. Um, then we saw the population, population increase again, and then we saw another little dip here in the you know, early 2010s. Um, and that uh, seemed to be related to, to shark bites. That's when we saw a real increase in uh, the number of uh, white shark bite, white shark bites, bites on sea otters. So um, I won't, I'll talk about that a little bit later, but, uh, but basically white shark bites on sea otters is a, a pretty big deal um, and has really seemed to suppress the, the growth of the population. Um, but then we saw a number of, uh, 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 you know, increases in the population through the uh, 2010s. Um, and uh, that, that was a very interesting, uh, again, another artifact of, of environmental conditions. So changing uh, uh, environmental conditions seem to have a big impact on the, uh, on the Seattle population. Uh, you probably know about the, the so-called the blob, the, uh, the warming of the ocean waters, the overgrowth of of, uh, of sea urchins, uh, the, the demise uh, of, uh, of the Pycnopodia sea star from wasting disease that uh, basically wiped them out along the entire uh, west coast of North America up through Alaska. And um, so these sea stars that were uh, predators of sea urchins were gone. Uh, sea otters were absent a lot of, in a lot of these areas and sea urchins started to overgrow. And in certain areas of the sea otters range, that was a good thing. Uh, this, the urchins were were eating well and had a lot of uh, a lot of row in them, and um, the sea otters feasted. And it seemed seemed like that was uh, 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 maybe the ra the reason why the sea otter population kind of grew in in this area up until about 2018 or so or 2019. Um, but then that seemed to to end, and uh, suddenly uh, the sea, sea urchins weren't so uh, full of uh, full of good stuff. And, um, and we saw up until 2019, this population start to start to drop again, but the trend was definitely downward. Um, and, uh, you know, hard to say why exactly, but um, uh, not, not a good sign. And the fact that we haven't had a, a good count over the last couple of years, um, you know, we don't know whether that trend has continued downward, uh, whether it's leveled off or what's happened exactly. So again, another reason why we're hoping to get a good count uh, this time around this year. Uh, let's see, I already had that slide in. So we've got a little jumbled activity. Um, so this gives you an idea again of what I spoke about with the, uh, the overall sea otter range. Um, you know, we're animals over in Northern Japan and uh, all the way down to Baja in Mexico. And you can sort of see the, um, uh, the, the entire area was inhabited by sea otters and um, uh, you can see where sea otters are now. So there's a, you know, definitely they've re-inhabited. Um, uh, there's even, uh, I, we don't get too many reports of, uh, of uh, numbers of otters in Japan, but there definitely are some there. Um, definitely the Kamchatka Peninsula, um, uh, Bering and Medney Islands and the, the Russian Commander Islands uh, through the Aleutian Islands. And, um, you know, there are a few areas where they haven't recolonized, uh, you know, obviously these areas of northern Japan that were historically inhabited by sea otters, uh, the Pribilof Islands, uh, and uh, some little areas uh, in, in through Alaska, but, but mostly it's been recolonized and uh, through Alaska. Um, areas of southeast Alaska where sea otters were, were reintroduced um, has, uh, has filled in quite a bit. Uh, British Columbia, the west coast of Vancouver Island. Uh, and even a little bit in the mainland of British Columbia, where sea otters were introduced, um, has, has filled in and grown quite a bit. Uh, northern down to central Washington, where sea otters were reintroduced, where uh, sea otters were taken from uh, the Aleutian Islands and translocated to, uh, to these areas. They, um, 
uh, managed to survive and and uh, and grow in population over a period of, of, of a number of decades now. Um, and then the, here's our little group down here in uh, in California, and um, uh, and there's a little group down at San Nicolas Island that was reintroduced there from the mainland population. Uh, so the, the gold area is kind of where sea otters are now, and you sort of notice that uh, you know we've got a big a big zone here, and then down through Baja where sea otters haven't recolonized, and I'll talk a bit about that. But um, the specific maritime fur trade, which ran from about the mid 18th century uh, till the early early 20th century, was was absolutely catastrophic <laughs> um, uh, for sea otters and, and a lot of other fur bearing animals. Uh, the, um, the the value of these furs uh, continued to grow throughout that period, um, and really by the middle of the 19th century, uh, the 1850s or so, uh, most of the otters were gone. They were still able to catch some in certain areas, but, uh, but the, the huge, um, you know, the, the peak uh, came and went and, um, and sea otters just kind of get, uh, kept getting picked off uh, in localized areas. Um, and uh, so these were, you know, Russian fur traders, um, but eventually, uh, um, you know, uh, Great Britain and the United States um, started getting involved and uh, uh, there really wasn't much left. And uh, another thing is it was extremely catastrophic for the native peoples of, of these areas, um, the native uh, Alaskan uh, peoples and certainly the uh, indigenous uh, tribal peoples in uh, along the west coast of North America um, were uh, hugely exploited and um, uh, this uh, system and this, these habitats, these species that they had grown uh, relied on um they were uh you know they were made to hunt them for these fur traders and uh they, they lost a lot of their um i think ability to uh to, to live in harmony with the land they, they suddenly saw uh this this great uh, uh exploitive um event that came in and and uh, just you know really wiped out these uh, these species so really a, a sad <laughs> sad chapter in in uh well, certainly in world history, but uh, but in U.S. history as well, um, and uh, there's those issues continue to to this day. So, um, but um, again, in California, uh, we saw this little population in the Bixby Creek area, which is where the, the sort of that uh, famous Bixby Creek bridge is along the Big Sur coast. Uh, until Highway One was put in, um, really the, the world was not aware that there were still some sea otters down there. And that was roughly 19, 1938. And then um, you can see on the little image on the right uh, that Southern Sea Otter expansion from uh, that, that dot here along the Big Sur Coast in 1938, uh, Sea Otters really expanded north and south uh, fairly consistently over uh, uh, you know, the next uh, you know, half century or so. Um, they moved uh, you know, all, not quite to San Francisco, um, and they, but they did get around Point Conception into Santa Barbara, uh, Santa Barbara County, moving towards Santa Barbara. But uh, but since 1998, they really haven't expanded beyond those beyond those points, and that's uh, that's kind of a big a big issue for a uh, for a population that's trying to to recolonize historical areas that they uh, they aren't able to expand north and south. Um, the existing habitat where they live is only able to hold so many otters, and um, you know, once it's thought that uh, uh, southern sea otters, maybe ranging from central Oregon down through Baja, uh, you know, numbered uh, 16,000 animals. Uh, so the fact that we can only uh, seem to get 3,000 animals in the space between, um, you know, say Half Moon Bay and, and uh, uh, down near Santa Barbara, um, uh, but the animals can't expand beyond that is, uh, is a problem for their uh, long-term um, uh, viability, I think. Uh, and part of the problem that we've seen has been, has been this white shark issue, um, that the great white sharks um, have been increasing in number. Uh, they've been uh, changing their habitat a little bit because of uh, warming waters. They've been moving northward. Um, and so it seems like the expanding sea otter populations moving south has sort of uh, run into the uh, expanding white shark populations moving north. And um, it's created what we call sort of a shark gauntlet where uh, the sea otters who try to move southward, um, you know, just kind of run into 
uh, fairly young white sharks that are just starting to feed on marine mammals, uh, switching over from fish. And, um, and then northward, uh, it's sort of always been an issue of, uh, of, uh, of white sharks um, biting sea otters. And if you can imagine a, a large elephant seal might get bitten by a white shark and might get away and, and has some bad bite wounds but can survive, uh, a little sea otter when it gets a, a bite from a great, great white shark is almost, almost always fatal. And the, uh, the sad thing, the thing that's even worse, is that we don't think the white sharks eat the sea otters. Uh, we've never seen a white shark with sea otters inside. Um, but they, uh, their natural history is to come up from underneath and bite something at the surface and then swim away and decide whether they want to eat it. And with the sea otter, they bite it and decide that's just a bag of hair and bones. I don't want to eat that. Uh, but it's, uh, it's a rough situation for the sea otter. So, uh, hard to know how to how to manage that, but it's a uh, it's another reason why it would be nice if we could get sea otters to expand their range. Now, here's as I talked about, here's kind of the uh, this target area of about it's, it's like almost 800 miles between central Washington, uh, all of Oregon, and uh, and northern California down uh, down to San Francisco. Uh, is you know it was a significant area for for sea otters. Certainly, San Francisco Bay, other estuaries up the coast. Um, and, and the open coast areas. Uh, so when we talk about how sea otters are gonna survive, particularly southern sea otters, uh, we really believe they need to expand their range northward. Um, maybe they'll expand southward as well, but uh, with warming waters, it seems like there are opportunities to, uh, uh, to re-inhabit their former range is probably gonna be northward uh, with the colder waters uh, the, the upwellings, the cold water, the, the food system that they depend on is, uh, is sort of reliant on, on that type of um, uh, that type of system. So um, when we talk about managing sea otters and what we should do for them, how we help them, uh, trying to figure out ways to help them expand northward uh, fits into that. And that's going to be uh, a lot of what Jessica talks about next week. So there's a bunch of numbers. <laughs> Let's see, so we're talking a bit about what sea otters are. Uh, some of this will be familiar to you, but uh, sea otters are marine, mem marine members of the mustelid family or, or the mustelidae. Um, they're related to all sorts of, uh, of these sort of weasley creatures, um, wolverines, badgers, river otters, skunks, ferrets, um, and, uh, and the little marine otter that lives down on the west coast of South America. Um, so uh, let's see, here's our, here's our sea otter buddy. Um, but they, uh, they all look alike. They've got some things in common, but they also have some differences. Um, and uh, we think in terms of evolution, sea otters began diverging from uh, ancestral otters about 10 million years ago. Um, this uh, creature that we refer to as an hydra, um, their genus name, uh, only entered the marine, marine realm. Why is that hard to say? The marine realm about two to three million years ago. Uh, much later than other marine mammals, uh, certainly whales and dolphins have been kicking around for 50 to 60 million years. Uh, pinnipeds, uh, you know, not quite that long, but you know, 20 to 30 million years. But sea otters are fairly recent uh, returnee to the uh, marine environment, and um, uh, and uh, are this tiny, tiny sort of outlier among, among marine mammals. Um, because of the fur trade, they suffered what's called the population bottleneck um, in terms of their genetic uh, uh, variability. Uh, but prob it's, it's thought that other bottlenecks probably occurred in the past as well. So there were other die-offs of sea otters um, uh, that happened well before the fur trade. So um, uh, I should have put this little thing in, but the Monterey Bay Aquarium has a nice little graphic that shows, uh, you know, sort of, um, the, the diversity in, in colors. So a bunch of different colors go through a bottleneck and suddenly there aren't as many colors and then it goes through another bottleneck and there aren't so many colors. Um, so you have uh, a population that has less gen genetic diversity, um, has lost uh, um, maybe certain functions of genes that can help them with, uh, say, survive certain types of diseases, um, help them uh, function well in their habitat. So, um, so these population bottlenecks are a problem. And um, uh, you know we're hopeful that that uh, sea otters can overcome those. Um, but all sea otter populations have low genetic diversity. Uh, but the southern sea otter uh, seems to have the lowest genetic, genetic diversity among all the sea otter species. 
And uh, the sea otter has its own unique suite of uh, marine ad adaptations. Obviously, they have uh, webbed hind feet. Um, they have these really cool, uh, large and highly efficient kidneys uh, for um, what's called osmoregulation. Uh, they can really handle salt uh, that they take in with their food or that they might sip from occasion. Um, so they can really concentrate their, their urine um, and, uh, and maximize their water intake. Uh, they have increased lung and blood volume for uh, flotation, for oxygen storage. Uh, they have an increased metabolic rate, a very high metabolic rate, uh, kind of a unique eye structure compared to other marine mammals. Um, very high tactile sensitivity, so that's uh, with their paws and whiskers, they're really good at, at, uh, at determining what's in their environment. You imagine if they have to feed at night, um, that they're able to uh, uh, find their food um, just using their, their touch. And uh, they've uh, developed dense bones, particularly things like their upper arm bones and, and uh, other things. And they develop some pretty unique and distinct behaviors, uh, like, like tool use, where they use uh, rocks and other objects to, uh, to bash open their their shelled prey. So uh, pretty, pretty unique in terms of uh, adapting to the marine environment. Uh, one thing that we're always glad of is that sea otters have no anal sacs. Uh, a lot of, uh, most, like most other mustelids have um, these scent glands that they can uh, uh, put down a pretty, a pretty stinky smell <laughs> around. I think a lot of people who have docks down near the water, uh, when river otters go up in there and uh, can create quite a, quite a smell, um, but we're, uh, all of us who work with sea otters are appreciative that they don't have these, uh, these anal glands and don't produce that, uh, that sort of stink. Um, obviously skunks are sort of the ultimate, uh, ultimate representation of that. Um, in terms of, uh, I won't go too much off into the weeds on these genomic studies, but some really cool stuff has happened um, recently in terms of uh, gene studies. Um, and uh, the, the, they basically uh, uh, created the whole, or looked at the whole genome of, of uh, northern and southern sea otters. Um, so the, the neat thing is they can see that there's been some selection for genes that are related to these, these aquatic adaptations, uh, particularly in their uh, like upper limb development. Um, you know, obviously uh, uh, the sea otter we know doesn't use their upper limbs the way that sea lions do, or the, even that uh, the little flippers that uh, cetaceans have. Um, they've developed these these upper limbs for being able to bash things and to uh, uh, you know reach around and, and groom themselves. So really cool uh, uh, limb development and is is observable in the genetic structure. Sorry, I've got a little little cat visitor here. Um, as well as some genes uh, that are related to hair follicle development. So uh, the sea otter's fur that is so vital to their survival um, uh, can be seen in, in their genetic structure that, uh, that's developed over time. Um, there's been loss in, in their ability to smell. So while they've developed other senses, um, they've lost uh, some olfactory receptor genes. Um, and that's, that's not so uncommon for other marine mammals. You think they're not gonna do much sniffing in in and underwater, but um, but they do use their sense of smell for uh, for uh, individual recognition and so forth. Um, as we talked about, there's low genet genomic diversity, um, signals of recent inbreeding, uh, and those coincide with we, we know that there's been a history of population declines over time, and um, and these declines, as I said, predate the fur trade. So. Um, uh, there's probably some some variants, some uh, um, some some bad things that have worked into the genetic structure of, of sea otters uh, that might impact the future recovery of the sea otter. So um, it's it's good to know what's what's sort of out there uh, or what's in the genetic structure of these animals as you look at uh, what sort of management options you have for them. How can you uh, ensure their survival um, uh, if you know that maybe moving them one place might put them into jeopardy because they don't have the uh, you know, the gen genetic capability to, uh, to handle, uh, you know, a disease in a certain area or something. So um, it's fa fascinating stuff. And again, I won't go into any more detail, mainly because I don't know too much more detail, but, uh, but it's, it's really interesting uh, what's happening scientifically with, uh, with these animals. Um, so here are just a couple of terms that um, you might or might not be familiar with, but, uh, you know, sea otters have been put forward as sort of the, you know, the emblematic keystone species. So this idea of a of a keystone, which is the uh, the one stone in the arch that, that kind of drops down and uh, allows the arch to uh, to hold its strength. 
Um, in the same way, the otter um, is uh, sort of the, the foundational species for, for it, its environment. It, it's able to hold up the structure of that system and, um, and uh, it has a huge, uh, huge Im influence and impact on that system uh, more, than, uh, uh, more than other species. So uh, there's also uh, this idea of a sentinel or indicator species and uh, what we call an umbrella species. So um, I'd done this as a little quiz in another talk, but uh, here's kind of the idea. The umbrella species is um, if, if you can save that species, if you imagine an umbrella, all the other species sort of under that system are, uh, are going to receive protections or, or be saved as well. So you think of um, you know, elephants in Africa, if you can preserve the habitat and the, and the system structure for elephants in Africa, all the animals that kind of live in that region are going to survive as well. They're going to benefit from, from that. Um, the keystone species, uh, again, it uh, sort of it de defines the entire ecosystem. And if the, the keystone is removed, uh, just like in that, that arch, the arch will collapse in a lot of systems. And we'll talk about this in a bit. Um, you remove the keystone and uh, the, the ecosystem tends to collapse. So uh, very important uh, species. And then this idea of indicator or sentinel species, um, if you ever heard the term canary in the coal mine. Um, so uh, if the, the canary isn't getting enough oxygen, it, it, uh, or maybe there's some gas in the, in the mine, it might keel over and that's an indication that it's not safe for humans. Um, in the same way as sea otter as a, as a prime uh, top predator in the near shore ecosystem uh, in the kelp forests and estuaries. Uh, if the otters aren't doing well, that's sort of an indication that that system isn't doing well. And that's, that's something we saw um, in the mid nineties with, with the disease, uh, disease outbreaks where uh, you know, we saw disease getting into the uh, sea otter system or showing up in sea otters. And then we were able to, able to track, uh, track back and see that a lot of this stuff was coming from the land um, and, uh, you know, things that we were doing on the land was getting into the sea otter system and, uh, you know, things that we can change and that, uh, in a lot of cases we did try to change. So, um, sea otters are a good, good indicator species of what's going on and, and, you know, right along the ocean, uh, and where it meets the shore. And, um, just, uh, some sea otter fun facts, uh, sea otters mate and often give birth in the water. Um, and, uh, but there are exceptions and we've got this amazing video from Monterey Bay Aquarium. I hope Jessica wasn't going to show up, but maybe she, she is, but uh, um, just a great opportunity to see uh, 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 how sea otter gives birth. And, um, you know, it's a pretty, pretty large baby for, for these animals, but uh, let's see, I'll go get back to it here. We can, there we go. So this female came right into the great tide pool at the aquarium and uh, during daylight hours. And the video crew was able to get right out and uh, get the best video of a sea otter being born that there's ever been. So, so the mother just uh, immediately starts fluffing up that, that pup fur and uh, so she can take that pup in the water. So um, that sort of jumps right into how do sea otters stay warm? And uh, you know, having worked with these animals for, for so long, uh, I, I could never, I could still never quite imagine how they do it um, because the water is so cold. And uh, you, know, you think if you go in the, the ocean here uh, along the Monterey Peninsula or even down in Southern California, um, you, know, you, can't, you can only stay in so long. And uh, so, uh, but sea otters have developed that, uh, that dense fur, the fur that's the densest of any animal on, on earth. Um, they rely on that hair and the air that they can uh, groom into the fur to stay warm in the cold ocean. They will actually uh, uh, blow bubbles and, uh, and rotate and flip around in order to get air that, will, uh, that they can groom into the fur and actually create a layer of air next to their skin uh, so that uh, for the in large measure, the water never actually touches their skin. So um, it's uh, uh, you know, a, wet a wetsuit that we might wear um, we get a little water in next to our skin between the suit and our skin and the water, our body warms that water up uh, and that keeps us warm a bit longer. Um, a dry suit on the other hand, uh, keeps the water from reaching our skin and we can stay 
uh, in the water even longer with a dry suit. So, um, so in some ways, the sea otter, uh, sea otter's fur is is like a wetsuit and a dry suit. Um, it keeps uh, it keeps them um, amazingly warm in in the water. But that's not the only way that they that they can stay warm. Um, they really lack the ability to store energy as fat, so they don't have blubber like uh, seals and sea lions and walruses and whales and dolphins do. Um, they rely almost entirely on that fur to, to keep the cold water away, but also uh, a really high caloric intake uh, that they, they eat a lot of food and take in a lot of energy uh, in order to, uh, to, to stay warm. So about 25% of their body weight each day they eat. Um, you know, I weigh something north of 200 pounds, so that would be about 50 pounds of food a day for me if I were a sea otter. Um, so that's, that seems like a lot of food. Um, and then just recently there was, uh, uh, again, I was, I was sort of saying, so they have this high metabolic rate, they eat a lot of food, they rest a lot uh, to conserve their energy, and uh, they have this great fur. I, I still could never quite understand how they uh, could stay warm, but uh, a new study um, has sort of determined that, uh, that in their muscle, uh, in, in all animals, uh, the, the muscle uh, produces heat. It's this, this thermogenesis that, uh, um, that occurs. And that can happen either through uh, contraction of the muscle, um, which we might uh, see as, as shivering. So when you get cold, you start to shiver. Um, and, uh, and that's actually a, your body's effort to uh, try and warm, warm you up. Um, but this non-shivering thermogenesis uh, from the, the mitochondria in the, uh, in the muscle uh, starts to leak uh, what amounts to essentially heat. So, um, so there's a little internal, almost like a little internal, internal furnace working um, within the muscle of the sea otters that allows them to, uh, to produce heat internally, uh, supplemental to their heat uh, that they gain from their food they eat or their activity or the, the heat retention that they have uh, uh, from their fur. So, um, so again, it's another, uh, another cool way that sea otters have adapted to um, living life in the ocean without, without a thick blubber layer and uh, can actually stay warm, uh, find food, um, have enough energy to reproduce and, and uh, travel and so forth. So, um, so they've, they've managed to do it. And it's, it's really interesting to watch uh, uh, with certain instrumentation, watch what a sea otter's temperature does during the course of the day um, as they're they're resting, their temperature will go up a bit, but then it'll start dropping. And once it gets to a point where they, uh, they have to actually start getting um, uh, active and they have to start finding food to kind of refuel and get that uh, cycle going again. So whereas our temperature stays you know, pretty steady throughout the day, um, you know, maybe say within a degree or so, sea otter's uh, temperature might change you know, four degrees or even more sometimes uh, as that cycle goes through of, uh, of just trying to maintain their, their temperature. So really interesting. And now we get to uh, the part of, of what role sea otters play in their habitat. Um, I think er pretty much everyone's familiar with the role that sea otters play in, in the kelp forest. Uh, they are the, the keystones of kelp. They are the, um, you know, a species that's, uh, uh, that's absolutely, uh, seems almost created to, uh, to function within that system. Um, and they, uh, they're extremely important for uh, the kelp forests uh, along the uh, Pacific Rim. Um, you can talk about the kelp forest food web, web in this diagram is a little busy, um, but they're, you know, they're what they call bottom up as well as top down forces working within the system. Um, it's, uh, you know, essentially a food chain. And, um, you know, the primary producers are feeding the next, the next layer in the chain and so forth. And the sea otter at the top of that chain um, uh, exerts a lot of influence, as we talked about, in their terms of their keystone role. Um, this little animal on the left here is, is uh, making, uh, is working on a number of sea urchins. Um, and, uh, but I think the, um, the key that we see is that sea otters uh, can specialize on a number of different food types. Uh, some will eat mostly urchins, some will eat mostly crabs, some will eat mostly clams. There's still a number of otters that will feed on abalone, um, even though they're a little bit hard to find. Um, and some will feed almost entirely on snails. Uh, but uh, they all kind of find their way. And as, if uh, certain foods become less prevalent, they'll start to diversify a bit and start eating more things in the system. 
but the, the effect this has is to uh, keep things you know, fairly much in balance so that nothing overgrows and, and takes over. And um, this is one of the problems that's happened in certain areas where sea urchins have begun to overgrow uh, in the absence of either sea otters or other, other sea urchin predators, for instance, up on the north coast of California, and even in our area here in Monterey and, um, and areas down south uh, where um, sea, otter, sea urchins just proliferated uh, you know, beyond, <laughs> beyond measure almost and started, uh, started feeding on the kelp and really the, the kelp in Northern California is virtually gone. Um, and we lost a lot of kelp here in the Monterey area. So um, uh, again, you see what happens when, when a, a keystone animal is removed. So whether it's a sea otter or an animal like the, uh, uh, the sunflower sea star, um, different, uh, different things take over and then the system gets out of balance and it's uh, problematic. Um, so here's an example. You can see uh, an area with, with healthy kelp. Um, there's a lot of, you know, a lot of diversity of life, a lot of biodiversity. Um, a lot of animals rely on the kelp, uh, you know, rockfish, uh, different types of crustaceans and other invertebrates. Um, and, uh, and when that kelp is gone, uh, you can see on the right side, the sea urchins have pretty much polished off all the kelp. Um, we call that an urchin barren because the, the zone is now barren of, of the life that was once there. And, uh, and you sort of can see there isn't much else other than, than the urchins and the rock. So uh, uh, this idea of uh, keystones and the sea otter's role as a keystone is, uh, uh, is really important. And um, that's again why we want to see sea otters uh, restored to these areas where they lived historically but haven't uh, managed to return to. And um, a recent study by, uh, uh, by Smith and others um, uh, right along here along the Monterey Peninsula, again, uh, when sea otters foraged on healthy urchins within uh, these remnant kelp forests um, that the sea urchins are starting to wipe out, um, you can see here the sea urchin with lots of, uh, lots of row. And um, uh, so the sea otters can, can actually uh, maintain those remnant patches of kelp uh, in, in areas like Monterey Bay. Um, but here's a, a shell in a, from an urchin barren, basically. And you can see it's, it's really extraordinary that these animals, these sea urchins, uh, can essentially go dormant and uh, they, they don't really, won't really reproduce. There's nothing for them to feed on, but, but they don't die. They continue on until there's uh, uh, you know, something to feed on. So as soon as little bits of kelp start to grow again, they're, they're right on top of it. So the system is is way out of whack and um, uh, none of the animals are really thriving. So the hope is that uh, remnant patches of kelp uh, with either sea otters or hopefully the return of, of the sunflower sea star um, gradually, uh, that these remnant patches can, can succeed and th then will reseed and replenish some of these urchin barrens with, uh, with healthy kelp forests again. Uh, so very, very complicated uh, uh, questions for the future. And then uh, we also look at sea otters as, as saviors of seagrass. They're keystones of kelp, saviors, saviors of seagrass. Um, studies in Elkhorn Slough in particular, um, it isn't quite so simple as, hey, the otters eat some sea urchins and that, that way the kelp stays healthy. Uh, in Elkhorn Slough in the middle of Monterey Bay, um, sea otters were uh, managed to uh, eat a lot of these little short crabs that, uh, that tended to feed on these uh, these little sea hares and sea slugs and things. And um, uh, it's really sort of a, it's a more complicated, uh, what we call a trophic, trophic cascade. In Elkhorn Slough, a lot of uh, uh, fertilizer and runoff from agricultural fields goes in and sort of fertilizes the algae that then grows on the seagrass and, uh, and more or less you know, snuffs it out. It isn't able to, to respire and, and uh, succeed. Um, these little, uh, Creatures uh, will go in and clean the seagrass. They'll eat the algae and, and uh, um, uh, epiphytes and things that are on the on the seagrass and keep them clean. And then they will grow successfully. But uh, with the absence of any predators of these shore crabs, um, they would they would actually go in and eat all these creatures. Uh, they couldn't keep the seagrass clean. Uh, the algae would overgrow and the seagrass would die. Uh, with the return of sea otters and Delcorn Slough um, in the uh, first in the 1980s, and then because of uh, uh, 
uh, some a program that the Monterey Bay Aquarium ran, um, sea otters started munching these these crabs, and lo and behold, these uh, these little animals started to come back and start doing their seagrass cleaning, and um, along with some other uh, restoration efforts in Elkhorn Slough, the seagrass is, is just uh, uh, you know bloomed and blossomed. So really, kind of a another cool example. And if you think about it, um, as sea otters were uh, sea otters probably didn't you know, wake up one day as kind of a river otter ancestor and say, hey, let's go out to the kelp forest. Um, you know, they moved in these estuary areas, estuary, estuary areas, and, uh, and began feeding on the, the easy prey there, and eventually worked their way out probably to the, uh, uh, to the marine environment and, uh, and the kelp forest where they were, had good protection from, from predators and so forth. So, um, so these, uh, the importance of sea otters to estuaries uh, which we hadn't really thought about much because sea otters have been almost wiped out. Uh, now we realize how important sea otters were probably to these, uh, uh, these estuary areas. And, um, and uh, that's a uh, kind of a cool, um, cool thing to think about in terms of uh, where sea otters should, uh, uh, should you know, where, where sea otters belong for, in the future. Um, so in terms of protection and conservation of sea otters, um, for protecting them now, uh, we want to minimize or mitigate the threats. There's not much we can do about white sharks, but uh, we can certainly do things about pollution and disease getting into their habitat. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about uh, well, time just flying by. I'll uh, move along here. Um, but minimizing and mitigating disturbance of sea otters by, by our activity, by human activity, and advancing that idea of coexistence. In terms of conserving them for the future, uh, we want to support their expansion of their range. We want to see them move back into those areas where they lived historically and uh, have the positive uh, ecosystem effects that they have in those areas and, uh, and continue to, to advance our uh, ability to live, live uh, peacefully with them. Um, just quickly, the federal statutes that protect sea otters. Uh, there was the first Seal Act of 1911 um, that basically protected, uh, this sort of the first international protection for fur-bearing animals. Um, folks finally woke up and realized that all these species were getting wiped out and that was probably a bad thing. So they came with some protections. Uh, the Marine Mammal Protection Act of 1972 uh, provided protections for, for all marine mammals in US waters. Uh, sea otters are com considered depleted under the Marine Mammal Protection Act. Um, Endangered Species Act of 1973, and then the listing of sea otters as threatened under the ESA in 1977, um, has really provided the, the most protection for sea otters in California. Uh, that is just, um, uh, just the uh, California's population is listed as threatened. Um, and then uh, as we saw with the last administration, and we'll get too political here, but, uh, but uh, you know, there were some attacks on the Endangered Species Act and other environmental laws uh, that, that undermine some of these protections, um, uh, potentially, you know, possibly allowing for more development that might be harmful to sea otters and other species. And their habitats. So it's uh, it's good to, as I talked about, what Defenders does, trying to um, uh, you know really fight for the, the preservation of these uh, of these important protective uh, uh, legislative acts. Uh, make sure they don't uh, they don't get uh, set aside or or undermined. Um, the major threats to sea otter survival in California, in particular these days, there's a whole list of things. Um, uh, the top three. I don't know. I think uh, there's still landboard pollutants and disease. Um, oil spills uh, is, is a catastrophic thing for sea otters and, and shark attacks. Um, right now, those are the things that, uh, that seem to be the biggest threats to sea otter survival in California. Um, I'll talk briefly about this group called Sea Otter Savvy in terms of looking at disturbance of sea otters and, and the impact of, of human activities on sea otters, uh, whether it's recreational or commercial activities. Um, this group called Sea Otter Savvy uh, started about, uh, I don't know, probably seven, and seven years ago now, eight years ago, um, and it's really done some neat work. Um, they're trying to foster responsible behavior by users of the marine environment uh, while they're viewing and recreating their sea otters. So you imagine kayaking, boating, fishing um, activities uh, in harbors and, and the nearshore environment where sea otters live um, can cause a lot of problems. We saw issues in the past with with uh, a lot of boat strike deaths, the sea otters, uh, people not paying attention when they drive their boats, 
um, a lot of disturbance by uh, by kayakers wanting to get close to get uh, the great picture. And uh, they're definitely disturbance hotspots in harbors and, and uh, near shore areas, uh, the Mont Long Monterey Peninsula and Elkhorn Slough, Monterey Harbor, uh, Morro Bay, and so forth. And um, uh, out of out of Sea Otter Savvy's work, um, a, uh, an annual Coastal Wildlife Disturbance Symposium has started up. Um, the next one will be in November 2022. Um, so there's just sort of this continuing movement of reducing human disturbance to coastal and marine wildlife. Um, and a new group called Respect Wildlife has grown out of that. So again, a lot of focus on uh, trying to help uh, people understand that uh, you know, maybe getting right next to that animal so you can get that selfie isn't the ideal experience you should be trying to have. You should be respectful of the animals that are trying to uh, uh, survive in, in their habitat, sometimes in very challenging conditions, and that by disturbing them, you're actually uh, uh, causing them harm. So uh, there's some, some quick ways you can tell, and one is through photography that uh, um, we, talk about whether a, sea, a photo is sea otter savvy uh, versus one that may have resulted in disturbance. Uh, if you see a sea otter's head or paws or body raised out of the water, uh, like it's, we call it periscoping, um, that's a, a signal. Um, is the otter looking right at the camera or the photographer? That's often a, a good clue that the otter has been disturbed. And, uh, and by extension, is there evidence of movement away from the camera? So is the otter uh, spooked? Um, is it, uh, you know, swimming away with uh, an obvious response to the photographer. So um, here's uh, just some examples, uh, uh, you know, which otters are, are showing natural behaviors versus ones that are disturbed. Uh, you can see this one here's in the kelp is pretty relaxed, but it's kind of looking right at the photographer. It's probably on the, on the verge of, of disturbance. And here's an animal that's, that's dry and, and, and resting. And if it has to move, that's gonna have an impact on its metabolism. It's gonna to have to maybe eat more food later. Um, here's a kayaker passing parallel to a group of sea otters. Uh, they're, they're relaxed and comfortable with that. Um, here's an otter in the seagrass in Elkhorn Slough, uh, yawning, paws up. Um, you think, is it responding to somebody? Uh, looks like it's just kind of doing its thing, but um, hard to tell in that case. Uh, here's another one where the otter is you know, looking like it's starting to move and is looking right at the camera. That's probably a disturbed animal. Um, here's a mother with her pup. They're just eating and going about their business. And here's a group of, of uh, several otters, many otters, dozen of, dozens of otters that are all reacting to something and are probably about to take off and split. And um, in areas, some of these hot spots, if you imagine that happens, uh, you know, once, twice a day, three times a day, you know, that's maybe a little bit of a problem. But in some cases, it happens a dozen times a day or more, and that's uh, particularly with a female with a pup. That's a that can be a big problem that uh, she has to get a lot more food to make up for for those disturbances. So, it can actually cause uh, uh, you know serious problems for for animals who are disturbed too much. So, in terms of, of calls to action, um, we had some of these graphics done for uh, Sea Otter Awareness Week in past years. But uh, how can you help otters? Um, you know, keeping your distance, if you're boating or doing other recreational, recreational activities, uh, keep your distance. And this is uh, true really for all wildlife. Um, you know, people want to get, get up close and personal, but the thing is, um, it might not be such a big problem for, uh, for certain types of wildlife if they have to move away, uh, as it is for an otter that's uh, kind of on the edge of its uh, thermal comfort zone. But um, but you know, watch the animals. Don't uh, don't disturb them. See, watch their natural behavior. You'll get a much better experience. Um, people can donate to the California Sea Otter Fund, which is now has a much longer name. But uh, California taxpayers can can actually contribute money to a fund that goes right into sea otter research. That's a good thing to do. Um, don't dump it. So um, think about the things you put that are going to go down storm drains and go right to the ocean. Um, think about what you. Uh, uh, you know, contribute to the uh, to the landfills and the stuff that ends up in the ocean and so forth. Um, uh, if you use pesticides or uh, fertilizers of different types, um, there are a variety of different pledges that you can take. Uh, we put together a little bit of one, uh, but uh, you know, in terms of spreading awareness, um, respecting sea otters and their habitats, uh, avoiding the use of toxic uh, chemicals that end up in the the watersheds and end up in sea otter. 
uh, sea otter habitat. Um, you can keep informed by looking at uh, Defender's website or websites of other groups that uh, help sea otters. Um, if anyone wants to donate a million dollars to the California Sea Otter Fund, that's always, that's always a helpful thing. Um, and there's actually uh, on the Sea Otter Savvy website, there's a pledge. Uh, so you just go to seaottersavvy.org. Um, you can take a pledge there and, and sign your name to it and they'll uh, add it to their list. Um, yeah, definitely donate that million. That's important. And uh, take the pledge. Um, you actually get a little badge from Sea Otter Savvy if you uh, take their pledge. Um, sea Otter Savvy and Defenders of Wildlife put together um, a... Uh, <clears throat> A, uh, a story map, uh, the extraordinary sea otter. So you can check that out. It uh, kind of goes down the down the coastline in uh, California and um, uh, looks at some of the history of, uh, of human interactions with sea otters and what's going on in particular areas. That's kind of a fun thing to do. Um, in terms of managing management actions for recovery, um, the, the the past. Uh, we didn't talk about this idea of recovery under the Endangered Species Act, but that's sort of where the southern sea otter is. Sea otters in California, we're really trying to, to recover them from near extinction. And um, this idea of ongoing passive monitoring. So we, we go out, we count the otters, we sort of watch them, we do maybe do some research on them, but we're not really doing any, any active management uh, to increase the population or help them expand their range. Um, so, but that's obviously, you know, do we just keep the status quo? Um, public education programs, I think, like Sea Otter Savvy and, and uh, Things Defenders does and the Aquarium does in Monterey um, are, are very important for trying to get people to understand how they can live with, with sea otters and other, uh, other marine wildlife. Uh, we can try to mitigate problems as they occur or minimize them so they hopefully don't occur in, in, in problematic ways. Um, or, you know, we could try to reintroduce these animals to areas where they were historically. And that's sort of the segue to Jessica's talk next week is, uh, you know, what are the ideas for actually um, taking an active role in helping sea otters expand their range uh, into historical habitat in North, particularly Northern California. There's a group up in Oregon that's looking to reintroduce sea otters to uh, the coastal waters of, of Oregon. And um, uh, these are areas where sea otters have been absent essentially for, you know, more than a century. So um, uh, kind of some, some cool ideas for the future that I'll, I'll leave for, for Jessica Fuji at the aquarium to talk about next week. Um, we do a thing called Sea Otter Awareness Week. This, this year is the 20th anniversary. Uh, it'll be on September 18th to 24th this year. Uh, the theme is Path to Coexistence. So again, that idea of coexistence. Um, you can check out our website for Sea Otter Awareness Week or there'll be some other, other sites that'll, that'll come up. And um, yeah, we try to have a theme each year and um, we had bridging the gaps, we had ecosystem mosaic, and now we've got path to coexistence. But this 20th anniversary year, we're gonna have a lot of different activities, uh, still some, uh, some virtual events and talks uh, online through various organizations. And we will um, uh, try to have some in-person activities too as, as things open up a bit. Uh, we have had some, um, uh, some spotting activities in Santa Cruz and, and uh, uh, Morro Bay, where you can go and um, uh, the people out there with, with spotting scopes and other things, and you can, you can check that out. Um, and uh, there's a program that's kind of run through Sea Otter Savvy, this We Were Here program, that's going to be talking about, uh, uh, you know, the return of sea otters to some of these areas, uh, educated communities and stakeholders about the value of sea otters uh, that, are, that are missing from their areas and have been for a long time. Um, so if you want to check out uh, a bit more about We Were Here, there's actually a stakeholder survey that you can look at uh, on the We Were Here website at Sea Otter Savvy. Um, it kind of talks about, uh, you know, what, what do you think about future, future ways to help sea otters? So that's uh, kind of a neat thing. And uh, you can hop on Defender's Sea Otter Facebook group. Um, and join us at uh, facebook.com slash group slash Defender's Sea Otters. Uh, we try to send out uh, some information or news about sea otters uh, uh, every week or sometimes more than once a week. And um, yeah, thanks for the, the Marine Mammal Care Center for the opportunity to, uh, to speak to you all about sea otters, one of my favorite subjects. And um, we're right about at seven, which may, be, may mean we'd have no time for questions, but uh, I'm happy to take any questions you have. Thanks a lot. I, I think we can take a few questions. Thank you so much, Andy. That was a, a really wonderful talk. And uh, a thorough introduction to our um, 
discussion on sea otters that we'll pick up uh, next Thursday uh, with uh, Jessica Fuji, who's going to talk to us a little bit more about um, the work being done with, with sea otters at the Monterey Bay Aquarium and some other fantastic things, I'm sure, as well. Um, so if you have any questions right now, if you want to add them to the chat, you can do it that way. If you want to um, unmute yourself, you could also do that to ask your question. And as you're thinking of that, um, I had a few questions that I've... Uh, uh, that came up to my mind as you were as you were talking today, and I, I was thinking about those um, those uh, urchin barons um, with the uh, sort of the empty uh, sea urchin. It doesn't seem like a very appetizing um, item for a sea otter that needs such a high caloric uh, output, um, and yet we talk about sea otters as being uh, or sort of input. Um, uh, as being these animals that could eat a bunch of sea urchins and, and help to kind of uh, get rid of the, the sea urchin barons. But it, it seems to me that they, they wouldn't really want to, to kind of mess around in an urchin barren. There's not a lot of food for them. So, so can you tell us a little bit about it? Like, would an otter actually help to eliminate a barren or is it, is it gone too far at that point? Yeah, that, that's a tough, uh, it's almost a chicken and egg thing where it's, uh, you know, you, you can't quite figure out how it's going to resolve itself, and and you're exactly right. I mean, the this idea that the the urchins have have nothing for the sea otters, so the sea otters aren't going to go there and clean up um, these uh, sea urchins that have nothing inside. Um, but on the on the edges of some of these barrens where there there is remnant kelp, uh, we, we have seen that sea otters are, are finding urchins with um, uh, you know with some stuff in them. And, uh, and are feeding on them, and th those little systems, uh, sort of microsystems, seem to be, uh, you know, coming back into some semblance of balance. So it's really going to have to be. It's probably a, a multifaceted effort of uh, a lot of groups are out there trying to, um, you know, smash urchins, go out and, um, you know, collect them and or smash them, and um, so they uh, and just get the numbers down. But it's it's an, an enormous undertaking, and and that alone probably isn't going to do it. So some combination of that, as well as some, some kelp growth and reseeding projects to try and get kelp reestablished in some of these areas and the return of the, the urchin predators. So that as uh, kelp grows and urchins start feeding on them again, uh, the top predators can start feeding on those urchins. Uh, um, but yeah, it's, it's, gone, it's gone way too far and it's way out of balance. So that's, that's the problem. So maybe a few more Pycnopodia who might not be as picky uh, at, yeah. at eating them. <laughs> Um, we have a couple questions in the chat. Um, how, you know, sea urchins have all of those spikes, um, and uh, sea otters look pretty soft. So, how does a <laughs> how does an otter manage to eat a sea urchin? Yeah, it's uh, I mean, again, it's one of those things that we have a hard time conceptualizing how they could how they could do that if you ever touched a sea sea urchin. But uh, um, sea otters are extraordinarily tough. They've got a tough tough hide. They've got tough snouts. They've got tough paws. Um, they've got tough teeth and mouth. Um, they're able to, to handle and manipulate the urchins uh, to get a, get a canine into the sort of the underbelly or the, you know, the mouth of the urchin and uh, crack it open. Um, it's, it's pretty amazing because the otters just seem to do it without thinking about it. But uh, it, it's, really, it's really cool to watch a, an otter take a, an urchin apart or a, or a large crab apart. But their uh, the capabilities, um, they've just they've evolved to be able to to handle that, that prey, and it's. Uh, uh, but you know, sometimes you do see. Uh, it's funny, particularly watching pups uh, learning how to feed. Uh, they'll you know they'll get poked, they'll get pinched by the crabs, uh, you know they'll uh, but they they learn pretty quick. <laughs> I was lucky enough to see a uh, mother uh, sea otter uh, eating some crabs at Morro Bay. Just uh, just going down into the rocks, finding a, 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 a rock crab, pulling it out, uh, and then dispatching it in, in a matter of seconds, you know, yeah. giving a, a, the scraps to the, the pup and then back down for another crab. Uh, yeah. Truly amazing yeah. how, they, how they don't fool crab. around. They, they know what they're doing. <laughs> um, we have a, another question from uh, Brenda Dominguez um, asking about opportunities to volunteer um, to support the preservation of sea otters. Um, you mentioned a, a few different ways that people can get involved, but um, do you want to just touch on that real quick? Yeah, I mean, just uh, just checking with the different organizations about uh, what sort of programs they have. I mean, uh, uh, Monterey Bay Aquarium, um, 
you know, had some difficult times during the pandemic, but are trying to you know, rebuild some of their, their volunteer programs. Uh, there's an age requirement. It's, when I was there, it was 18, um, but there are a lot of programs at the aquarium uh, that kind of move up the age scale uh, in terms of uh, learning about ocean environment and uh, uh, kind of getting some, some exposure to some of these programs. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's sometimes tied to age, but uh, um, just getting out and learning how you can help with, uh, uh, with different activities um, in these near shore habitats. Uh, um, you can, sometimes it's interpretation, sometimes it's helping out with, uh, with projects. Um, so it depends on what you wanna do and then you know, just, just contacting different organizations and finding out what they're up to and, and maybe what they have to offer. And maybe um, dropping a line to your local elected and making sure that they have some sort of a plan for ocean conservation in general. And um, if you're in sea otter territory, make sure they have uh, an understanding about um, the sea otters in their neck of the woods and a, and a plan for their conservation. Yeah. Make sure we, we keep it at the top of the levels of, of our elected officials. And, and certainly um, if, we, if we do investigate things like trying to move otters to uh, you know, new areas in California, it's gonna be a huge need to connect with communities. Um, uh, and and there, there has been talk about maybe possibly moving south as well, but, uh, um, but connecting with communities, making sure people uh, developing support within those communities, within the elected officials, um, uh, with, with indigenous communities, with fisher groups. Um, some of these groups aren't maybe so keen to have sea otters return and uh, possibly compete for, for their commercial uh, seafood products. But uh, at the same time, uh, the, the health of the near shore ecosystem um, is, is extremely important to, to you know, everybody, to the livelihood of fishers, as well as uh, um, you know, our preservation of our shorelines and so forth. And sea otters play a big role in that. And they're very valuable as, uh, uh, as we call them ecosystem engineers sometimes. They're very important species for, uh, for these near shore habitats. Um, so we have another question from, from Tara uh, Killip. Tara, do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question? I do. I was in Pacific Grove over the weekend and I came across Sea Otter Savvy and the Fish and Wildlife Service. They were doing a study of drones and the disturbance it uh, imposes on sea otters. And I was just trying to figure out how frequently people are using drones to monitor for their own personal use and why that this study has come about. Yeah, there's a, a couple of reasons. I mean, you know, we've seen with the, uh, I mean, drones are really cool. <laughs> they do some amazing things and, and get uh, amazing uh, uh, video. And that's that's intriguing from a, from a re uh, wildlife research point of view. There's a lot of applications for that. At the same time, we wanna make sure that, uh, you know, the people aren't buzzing sea otters and other wildlife. There's some big, big disturbances of, of nesting terns down in Southern California um, a number of months ago uh, that was, you know, all the, all the eggs were abandoned, you know, it's just a terrible thing. Um, and so, you know, trying to make sure that there are, you know, proper procedures and protocols and, and laws even that, uh, that kind of regulate uh, how people, you know, fly their drones and, and get to getting them to understand the potential disturbance uh, effects. Uh, the, the project that the Fish and Wildlife Service in Seattle Savvy is working on um, has a lot to do with, with uh, trying to find new methods of, of counting sea otters and, um, and possibly even uh, doing other types of research monitoring of sea otters. Uh, the, the way that the sea otter counts are done is a whole heck of a lot of people get out there, hopefully within a fairly narrow time period, and you know, get on the cliffs and the, and the beaches and the rocks and, um, and just and with spotting scopes, binoculars, and just you know, manually count the number of sea otters um, that they see. And a lot of these areas are hard to reach. Some areas require aerial uh, aerial surveying. And this idea that hey, if you can get you can fly a drone over one of these sections, uh, take some photographs, and have it uh, you know digitally analyzed uh, later, uh, that could save a ton of time. Probably be more accurate. And um, uh, and I mean the the the, the manpower, the people power in, that's involved in that is is pretty extraordinary. So if you cut back on the need for so much uh, so much resources, that would be a really good thing. So uh, yeah, so they're trying to determine um, you know what at what elevations our otters seem to react to the drones. Um, we know that otters in different areas will react differently. So otters that are maybe 
a bit more habituated to human activity, say along the Monterey Peninsula. Um, but if you go down along the Big Sur coast, uh, they'll probably freak out, you know, at the first sight, sight of the drone. So um, it, it's a it's a neat project to hopefully find ways and parameters by which we can use drones uh, for research and also give uh, um, you know better indications to the, the public about uh, uh, you know how to appropriately use drones. So. Um. So we, we had another question in there um, that uh, seemed simple at first, but now I'm intrigued. It was a question about the gestation period for, for sea otters. Um, and I you know, did a quick Google um, to, to answer that question. And uh, it came up as between 122 and 365 days, um, or like something like four to 12 it was a huge range. Um, can you provide some insight there? Sort of. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 been a um, it's been interesting to try to sort that out. And some uh, really the, the best work, uh, Seattle Aquarium has done a lot of good work um, looking at uh, at hormone levels um, and trying to capture exactly when uh, uh, when conception happens and then when uh, sea otters have a, a delayed implantation, they're able to delay. Um, uh, implantation of the blastocyst so, uh, so that uh, they can sort of maybe time their birth to a period where they're going to be in better physical condition. Um, uh, we often look at uh, uh, pinnipeds pin like California sea lions do that as well. And uh, particularly for an animal that, that all tries to congregate at a very specific time of year, say, you know, May and June for California sea lions to, to give birth and then mate for the following year. Um, that, that timing is really important. Sea otters, it seems to be more tied to their, their physical condition. If you imagine a female that's for her entire adult life is in a reproductive cycle. So she mates with a male, gets pregnant, uh, gives birth to a pup, nurses that pup, uh, weans that pup, gets mated by the male again, and gets pregnant again. So she never really has much of a break. So it's very important that she has a little bit of time uh, to you know, recondition herself. So I, I always talk about the, the six and six thing. So the, the pregnancy is about six months. Um, it, it's a little vague on when in there, uh, you know, the, the actual implantation happens, but I think it's about six months. And then we generally in California see that the, uh, the mother take care of, keeps the pup for, you know, up to about six months or so, not too long after that. Uh, I think we see northern sea otters sometimes hang on to their pups longer, um, but uh, but generally females here will wean their pups at you know roughly six months, and um, and then that cycle starts again. So we see this interbirth interval of maybe just over a year. So a female will get pregnant, raise her pup, um, you know, wean her pup, and then mate again, and so basically having a pup a year uh, is how it works out. So. I'm sort of scattered all that that makes sense so i I'd, I'd say that i i think that the that the pregnancy is about six months that's what i usually say but there's a delay period in there as well so it sounds like um there's a uh, plenty of room for another phd in there oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> awesome uh well thank you andy for for taking some time with us today it's been really fascinating um, I hope you guys all enjoyed our, our lecture tonight, and I hope you can join us again next Thursday when we talk with uh, Jessica all about uh, sea otters again. So thank you for joining us tonight, and we hope to see you again next Thursday. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, everyone.